very, very privileged to preach the gospel here this morning. And that's my heart and my passion, is to minister the gospel, the good news, the too good to be true news. Amen? And uh, that's my passion in life, to see people's lives being transformed and changed into the reality of who they are in Christ Jesus. There is nothing in this life that is more exciting than to come to the realization or have the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's nothing more amazing than to hear His voice and to walk in the Spirit. And that's what's really blessing my life. This is what I'm living for, that I just can hear God's voice. I had a dream about this church last night, and uh, I will share that on the end. I was meditating on some stuff, and I had an awesome dream about you guys, and I believe that God's going to do something amazing here. Amen. Amen. So my beautiful wife, Kathy, she's here with me. Her first time in South Africa, we introduced her to a bride yesterday, and uh, a real South African bride. They barbecue in the States, which is with propane gas, stuff like that. We have real wood and coals <laughs> and bread. They even yesterday, they baked bread there. Where's my sister who baked the bread? She's not here this morning. Um, we had even homemade bread, and it was just awesome. Peppermint crisp tart, I think. Something like that. Milk tart. All the good stuff. Amen. Some of you don't know, I pastored a church in Barberton. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I immigrated to Canada, and I've been traveling in the United States and Canada preaching this gospel of grace. For the last 15 years and i'm back in 10 years time i don't know why now but uh, god got a plan with this um i uh, uh grew up in a makwaland okeep i was born in okeep how many of you know where okeep is close to springbok do you any in the makwaland people here <laughs> my dad was my dad worked in the copper mines and uh, then at the age of 10 he retired i came late he was 50 when i was born when he retire, retire um, we moved to Citrus Dal. Some of you know where Citrus Dal is. And I lived there. So uh, I was a young, as a young kid, I struggled with, with, and even as a young man before I met Jesus, I struggled with deep rejection, fear of rejection. I could not speak in front of audiences like now, like this. I couldn't do this. Um, Afrikaans, I failed that on school. I had an F for Afrikaans, which is, stands for fantastic. I... <laughs> I had, uh, I didn't even have an F for English, <laughs> so you must just know where I'm coming from. And one day God just told me, begin to preach in English, and I said, really? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so I just begin to do this, and then we end up in the States. So the people love it when I preach in the States, and they just love it. You know, even if the tenses and the sentence construction is sometimes messed up, they just love it. I don't know why, but God got a purpose in that. But we as a South African nation, we are a very unique nation. Everybody in that, in that coming from South Africa, it doesn't matter where they go in the world, they make an impact. It's, and I'm not saying this to, to minor other nations and stuff. We are a very unique group of people. It is, it's just a reality. Wherever we go, it doesn't matter what we do in the world. If you are a doctor or a plumber or, what, or a pastor or a preacher, we really make an impact in the world and, and I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the fact that I grew up in this country and I can be part of, I never left this country in my heart. South Africa will always be in my heart and I follow what's happening. I have a lot of friends in this country and I follow what's happening here and it's always very close to my heart and I, even this church, how this church come to reality, um, how Downey moved from Palaborva, him and Tasha, do I pronounce it right? Tasha. Us anyway, forgive me. Anyway, so how, how this developed and everything. And Donnie was in, in Canada with us, and uh, he was just there in the background. Nobody knows him. He was just another guy until they gave him a guitar and he sing. And I had to, some woman came to me, Is that guy married? So like, Even two, three guys came, Is he married? That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they like him. Hannes is here in the back. Hannes was with us in Portugal, also in Canada, minister with us. It's awesome to see you guys again. Amen. 
So this morning, I've, I don't want to say a lot, but let's start off here and let's preach the gospel. That's more important. Amen. And I'm going to talk this morning about the cross and the resurrection. And uh, it's simple stuff. I'm very ordinary. My message is very simple. The purpose of me preaching is I want you to get it because God is real and I want you to receive what God got for you. That is the whole new covenant is about receive, receive, receive. Everything is for free. Isn't that awesome? You don't have to work for it. You don't have to perform. You don't have to have a better behavior. You receive it all for free. That's the new covenant. Huh? And that's so awesome. And God, God loves you more than you can ever imagine. And that's why you need to, uh, 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 Peter say in first, uh, Second Peter 1, he say, Grace and peace be multiplied to you as you grow in the knowledge of God and our Father. So if you grow in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, grace and peace is being multiplied to you. So it's all about knowing who He is. Knowing how much He loves you. Knowing that He cares for you. He knows even your thoughts, the things that you worry about in life. He knows about your passions, your dreams. He knows about it all. And He wants to be involved in that. Did you know that? He wants to guide you into it. I speak to so many people in churches and 80% of them don't even doing or work or live a life that they are really passionate about. They're doing stuff that they hate. They hate their job. They hate what they are doing in life because they have never found the plan and the purpose that God got for them. Once you find that, if you find your passion, some people say, well, if I have to go in that direction, my salary will drop like, say, $10,000 or 10,000 rand. But you know what? If you live your passion, God will always provide. It's, it's more important to do in life what you are passionate about than to do something that you hate. Do you agree with me on that? And if you are led by the Spirit of God, He leads you into that and that I, I can only preach. I can do nothing more. I can just preach. That's it. I can just speak a lot of nonsense sometimes. And I, when I was young, I would talk a lot of nonsense. I was always like the, the, the loudest one in the party. So Jesus says, let's call him. Let's, <laughs> let's use him rather than in the right direction. But I'm passionate about preaching and ministering the Word of God. So this morning, I want to start off with a verse here. It's a well-known verse. We all know it. <coughs> and I just want to show you something out of it, say, in Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, for it's, uh, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. He who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. I don't really think that if you have found Christ, that you have come to the revelation of Christ in you, you need to seek anymore, because you have found it. Why must you seek something that you already found? Are you guys with me? That verse, this whole uh, book, or this whole letter is written to the Hebrews. How many of you know this is people who were believing in Jesus, but they were influenced with Jewish doctrine, and now the writer of the Hebrews is bringing them back to the reality of who they are in Christ Jesus. He is setting them free of the influences of the law. If you read this whole passage. So that's what it is. So he said now, in verse 1, he said, Now faith is the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of the things not seen. But faith is, he say, a God is pleased. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You believe, you believe that God, you must believe that God is. Amen. So God is, right there, it says a lot. Right there, God is. How many of you know that all the Jews believe that God do exist? So he's not talking about the existence of God. He's talking about God is. He's talking in the present tense. Everything you need is in Christ. And if you read Hebrews 11, you can't just read Hebrews 11. You have to begin in chapter 10 and then you have to go to the end because this passage in Hebrews 11 is written between two verses. It's almost like a sandwich. You can put it. It's like the bread and then everything in between and then another slice of bread. It's almost like a sandwich. So let's go to those verses and I say to the guy next to you, it's going to get better, don't worry. Okay, he, he say here, for by one offering, Hebrews 10, 14, for by one offering, he has perfected those who are being sanctified. Say perfected. That's where he started. He said, by one offering, we have been perfected. Isn't that beautiful? 
And then in chapter 11, the last verse in chapter 11, those days they didn't write with chapter 1, chapter 2, and it was just a letter that they wrote. And, but in that context, the last verse, this is what he say, and the, all these, all these people who were walking in faith, that he mentioned, Abraham and, and, and Joshua and all those people, he said, all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that we should not be made perfect apart from them. Isn't that beautiful? So the whole context here is about perfection. It's everything in here is talking about the fact that we have been perfected in Christ Jesus. And they did not receive the promise. You know what's the good news? We have received the promise. Hallelujah. You are a perfect work this morning. So, you know, when I came into grace, when I came into the message of grace, um, it, it took me a while to come to the reality that I have been forgiven for eternity. That How many of you know that this morning, if you believe in Jesus, you are as innocent as Jesus is right now? You are as righteous as Jesus is right now. I preach in a little Pentecostal church in a uh, place called Boys, Boys Town in uh, uh, New Brunswick, Canada. And my friend David Williston, he, the pastor asked him to introduce me. <laughs> These people have never heard the message of grace in their lives before. Never ever. You understand what I'm talking here? And David introduced me and before he introduced me, he said, I am as holy as Jesus is right now. And he go and sit down. And all those people look at me like a cow see an open gate for the first time. It's like, what's going on here? And everybody look at me and I'm like, I have to fix everything this guy has said to me right now. Said to these people right now. Because saying to those people, I'm as holy as Jesus is right now, that's a big mistake. But you know, it's a truth. It's a reality. You are as holy as Jesus is right now. And some people listen to you. The, the grace message is so difficult for people to accept. Just this thing of, yeah, but I sin. Yeah, but I make mistakes. That's not what it is about. If you believe and understand who you are in Christ Jesus, when you know that you are righteous, then that righteousness begins to work in you. How many of you agree with me? And God, Jesus, has come to set you free of all sin conscience. You're not a sinner. You're as righteous as Jesus is right now. I, I could deal with that. I could break that mindset in me. The Holy Spirit helped me to break that mindset in me that I can be free of, I'm not a sinner. I'm as righteous as Jesus is right now. But you know what I struggle with? And I think a lot of people struggle with, and I want to speak about that today. And this is a huge paradigm shift that needs to come down in the mind of man. And the, the hardest thing for people to believe in this day and age that we are living is it is a finished work. The hardest thing for people to believe is if their finances is a mess, to rest in the fact that Jesus has already provided everything. The hardest thing for you is if you have pain in your body and you struggle with a sickness and you have your mind have to come to the conclusion that Jesus has already healed you. Because that pain is speaking louder than what God is saying to you. It's a huge paradigm shift in the mind to move from a gospel that's proclaiming that something in the future will happen with you. God will provide for me in the future. God will bless me in the future. God will heal me in the future. And to move from that to the reality of it is done. It's finished. I'm already healed. God has already provided for me. God already got a plan for my life. It's a huge paradigm shift. I, I had a kidney disorder in my life. The doctor pointed me at me and said, you're going to die. He told me, you're going to die. I took condemnation from that statement. But Jesus showed me the reality of who I am in Him, and I was healed completely of it. Nobody really prayed for me or lay hands on me. Jesus did it. But So this morning, if, if we want to break down that paradigm shift that's that's in the minds of people. That's in the, because circumstances speak. 
I mean, you can't deny the fact that there is trouble in this world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So we can't deny the fact that there is trouble in this world, but the fact is, from what position are you functioning in this world? So this is where the cross come in. And you know what is interesting about the cross? Can I just deal with you a little bit, some things here? The message of the cross, if you look at the early church, if you look at the book of Acts, I read through the book of Acts and then I see um, that the apostles testify about the resurrection of Jesus. Have you seen that? See, a lot of times they, they, they testify about the resurrection of Jesus. They didn't really speak much about the cross. Did you know that? Go and read through the book of Acts. They didn't really preach the cross. Because the cross was a symbol of defeat in the Jewish mind. It was a symbol of defeat. You were a criminal because it was not the Jews who crucified you. It was the empire. It was the, it was the Roman Empire who crucified you. And when you were crucified, you were seen as a criminal. It was a symbol of defeat for, the, for, the, for the, the followers of Jesus. That's why when that lady saw Peter, uh, uh, when Jesus was crucified, she said to him, you are one of them. He says, I don't know that man. Isn't that interesting? Think of it this morning. That's why when Peter preached the first time, he says, you killed the Lord of glory, but God raised him from the dead. He didn't say anything positive about the cross. Nothing. Isn't that interesting? The cross was absolutely an emblem of defeat. And they still didn't have it in their minds what really happened because they thought that Jesus would come and restore the kingdom to Israel. Even just after the resurrection, they still ask him this question. When are you going to restore the kingdom unto Israel? And Jesus said, the times of that is in my father, that's in my father's hands. That's his authority. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. And here comes Paul two decades later and Paul bring the cross out of darkness into light. And Paul say, hey, the cross is not actually a defeat. It's actually victory. And Paul said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us, it's the power of God. Isn't that awesome? Paul brought it out of darkness. Paul was actually the guy who restored the cross theology. They didn't preach the cross. He preaches the cross. He brought it out. He said, it's not a defeat. It's the power of God, the message of the cross. Why? Because if we, if we separate the cross from the resurrection, then we don't really know why Jesus died. Am I right? See, the cross can be a symbol for many people, but the cross really means it is finished. Jesus finished sin. Isn't it true? The cross really means He finished with sickness. He died. When Jesus went to that cross, listen to what I tell you, you were in Him when He was on that cross. That sickness that was in your body was in Him on that cross 2,000 years ago. The cross is the symbol where Jesus finished everything. He finished with sin. He finished the old man. He finished the curse. Isn't that beautiful? And three days later, one new man came out of that grave. And we were in him because Paul say in Ephesians 2 verse 4, Paul say, but God who was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with him. By grace you have been saved. He put it in brackets there. Raise us up together. Say together. Made us sit in heavenly places together. Isn't that beautiful? That in the ages to come, He might show us the exceeding riches of His grace in kindness towards us. Isn't it beautiful? The grace message is not only about Jesus finish your sin. It's also about you in being raised from the dead and seated with Him in a place of victory. That's the church. That's the body of Christ right there for you. I'm this morning in the most powerful place ever in this town. Because everybody sitting here have resurrection power in them. Hallelujah. You're not just something. 
You're not just something flowing through this world. Come on. You are connected to the kingdom of God. You are seated with Him in heavenly places. A guy in Alberta, he's a um, heavy equipment operator. He began to develop knee problems and his knees got swollen. And uh, his, his boss is also a Christian and he said to his boss, man, this is, this is not good what's happening here. He says, I'm in pain. <clears throat> and um, the doctors look at him and they say, it won't be long, you will have to stop this, this heavy equipment operate. You will have to stop doing this kind of work. Your knees is, is basically done. One day he go and lie down on his couch in his living room and he begin to meditate on the cross. He begin to meditate how Jesus took all sickness and pain and disease. He just begin to meditate on lying on that, lying and meditate on that. Next moment, he feel a heat go through his body and he saw in a vision how Jesus came out of the grave, resurrected. And he felt a heat went through his knees and he jumped up from his couch and he jumped around in, in, in the room and he said, I'm healed, I'm healed. What happened here? And Jesus says, because you meditated on the cross, the Holy Spirit came and combined it with the resurrection and you were healed. <laughs> he went back to his job and he said to his boss, I'm healed. And he jumped up and down there. The boss said, you got to stop. He says, no, I'm healed. Jesus really healed me. And he told him the story. You can't separate the cross and the resurrection from, from, from one another because it's almost like electricity. It's like a negative and a positive. The cross stands for something negative where Jesus took all the negativity on him and the resurrection stands for positive. You bring that positive and negative together, you have power. Is it right? Huh? When you bring the cross and the resurrection together, you got power. Isn't it true? Because the cross is basically negative. The first time that I thought about it is when I heard a sermon of John Wimber. How many of you remember John Wimber many, many years ago? He was from the Vineyard Group. He had a healing. He had a real powerful healing ministry. He had a dream one night that he walked into a Roman courtyard and he saw a man that was fastened to a pole and they were whipping him. And he knew in the dream, this is Jesus. And Roman soldiers were, were whipping, him, whipping Jesus. And he saw it in this dream. And, and he, in his dream, he became like, he saw, he saw the reality of it. He became like, um, he wants to cry. And then Jesus turned his face and looked at him. And John says, my face was in his face. It was my face. And Jesus says, John, I did it for you. <laughs> You know that you were in Christ when he started, when his sweat turned into blood in that garden. You were in Christ when they put the crown of thorns on him. You were in Christ when they whipped him. You were in Christ when they beat him in his face. You were in Christ when they crucify him, put the nails through him. You died with him. You rose from the dead, a brand new man. Isn't that beautiful? That's why if we look at the cross, it's foolishness to those who are being perished, but perishing, but to us, it's the power of God. Because there, the old Peter swore that struggle with rejection and fear and from time to time depressed. He died. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? And he rose one brand new man from the grave. With Jesus, we're alive. Peter said, this is just a tent. Paul said, this is just a temple. See, if I preach the true gospel, guess what happened? If I preach the true gospel and you begin to hear the true gospel, you guess what happened? You begin to crucify the thoughts of the old man and you resurrect the thoughts of the new man. That's what happened. If we preach the true gospel... It actually crucifies the thoughts of the old man and it resurrects the mind of Christ in us. I love that. Paul came right through the book of, of Romans and he described how righteous we are. Not by works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Just by believing. I preach the gospel. I believe at this moment I've persuaded some of you in your hearts that the cross is real. 
I believe that at this moment I've persuaded your heart that I am alive with Christ. I believe that at this stage, even though you have pain in your body, it's just symptoms. The reality is you've been healed 2,000 years ago. It's like Donnie said yesterday, your, your body just need to hear it. <laughs> your body just need to come in agreement with what Jesus has done. Isn't that true? That's why the Word is living and active and powerful. That Word that He is talking about is not just a little scripture. It's the Gospel. It's the good news. Because if you read the newspaper today, how many of you agree with me? It's yesterday's news. They don't write, there's no prophetic newspaper that come out and say tomorrow this is going to happen. You don't read it. You hear yesterday's news. That's why the gospel is good news. It's something that already happened. Everything that you, everything that you try to live by in, out of the Bible, and it's a future event, or you try to live up to a standard to receive something in the future, that's not good news. Good news means it is done. Jesus has already done it. That's good news. So therefore, the word is powerful and active. And sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating or bringing division between soul and spirit. But listen to this. Even cutting to joints and marrow. Right down to the nerve system of mankind. Woo! That means that your body is coming in, in line and agreement with what Jesus has already done. And it's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And in the next verse, he say, he talk about that... We can come to the throne of grace. You talk about that everything is finished. You can come to this throne where Jesus sat down. He don't work anymore. Is this simple? I know Donnie preach over your heads every week, so I just come and come and fix stuff here. <laughs> I'm joking. But Paul come right through the book of Romans and he talk about how righteous we are. And he, he, he established all those things and he says, reckon yourselves dead to the law. Whoa. Some of you would say to me, well, I'm not under the law. I'm a new covenant. Anything that you do to try to get God to love you more or anything you do to, get, to, to please God in your own strength and ability, you're under the law. You're under the elementary principle of the world. If I'm good, I'm blessed. If I'm bad, I'm punished. It's horrible to live there. The whole world is screaming that out to us. Isn't it true? You go through school, it's peer pressure. Look at the woman here today. All of you try to look more beautiful than the other one. Look at my dress. Look at my makeup. Look at my hair. It's all good. Because we really want you guys to look good. <laughs> we as men, we are like that. But isn't it part of the pressure that's in the world? We grow up. We have to perform in this life to make it. And it's all good. Do your best. Get high degrees. Do your best at your job. But guess what? When it comes to Christianity, you can't bring that stuff into Christianity. It's already hard in the world. Why do that in the church too? Come on. This is why God, we come to God and He say, the work is done, rest. For the last six months, I was in, in the United States and, and, and it was a huge transformation that took place in my life and the change over. And I, in my nature, I want to do things. How many of you are like that? You just want to do things. And then every time I, want, I say to God, this is, this is really crunch time now. Come on. we got to do something. And I say, rest. Sit down. Don't do anything. Let me feed you. Come on. Now there's something else I want to show you. <laughs> there's a new revelation that you don't know about. Isn't it awesome? So here we come to this final thing. They say I must preach for three hours. Let me see what I got more here. <clears throat> um, see, see what is interesting is that we are not working towards a position of victory. We are working from a position of victory. It's already done. Napoleon, how many of you remember Ma Napoleon? He was a war hero many, many years ago. <laughs> but in those days when people attacked, they had drummers that stand on the hills, and the drummer play a specific tune, and then the people know this is an attack or this is a retreat. All the warriors, they can hear the drums. So they play a specific... So one day they were in battle, 
and Napoleon saw that they are losing. So we shout to the drummer, play the retreat. But the drummer keep on playing the attack. And after a while he got agitated with this guy. He says, what is wrong with you? Are you disobeying my command? He says, sir, I've never learned how to play the retreat. I can only play the attack. And you know, it's a mindset. Are you guys with me? We have so learned to retreat. We have so learned to fall into, when will God do it for me? When will God come through me? It's a mindset. Are you guys with me? The gospel brings renewing in the mind that we understand it is done, it is finished. It's a paradigm shift that needs to take place in your mind. That you can't go back even though the circumstances, the things in your body, finances, relationships telling you different. You know in your mind, I'm in Christ. I'm in the kingdom. I'm already blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. I belong to God. He's my father. It doesn't matter how it looks. I'm already in victory. Are you guys with me? That's the gospel. That's the good news. See, Paul says, when I was with you, I was not with persuasive words, uh, uh, trying to persuade you of human wisdom and intelligence of mankind. He says, the only thing that I want to know among you was Jesus and Him crucified, nothing more. And then he talked about revelation knowledge. Excuse me. Suddenly he talked about revelation knowledge. He said, It has not come up in the heart of man or in the mind of man the things that God is prepared for those who love Him. But we have received the Spirit of God that we might know the things that He has freely given us. So it's all about being guided and led by the Spirit of God on the end of the day. Because if there is circumstances right now you probably just need wisdom from the Holy Spirit. And here's the good news. The Holy Spirit works in an environment of peace. He don't work in an environment of worries and trouble and stuff like that. He wants to bring you to peace. That's why the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when He comes, He will convict you of righteousness. Why? Because the fruit of righteousness is peace. Isn't that true? Therefore being justified or declared righteous or declared innocent, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ in whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. That's why he would tell you, because some people think righteousness only means my sins is forgiven for eternity, which is true. I stand before God just as if I've never sinned, which is true. But do you know what righteousness really means? Righteousness means you qualify for all the blessings. Not because of your good works, because Jesus made you righteous. Amen. You qualify for every promise. That's what righteous, you have a right to be a son of God. You have a right to be in the kingdom. You have a right to receive from God. Isn't that beautiful? That's the gospel. And that happened on the cross. That old man always think that he, he's not worthy enough to receive anything from, anything from God. I don't have enough value if there was pr a problem with his value. Always feel like I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. Jesus killed that man. You were in that man on the cross. Hallelujah. And Jesus came out of that grave, one new man, and he said, you are all righteous just by believing in me. Nothing more. You're all, you all have value. I consider you good, in, good enough. <laughs> that theology that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that thing dies. And now we are eating from the tree of the knowledge of good. Oh, excuse me, from the tree of life. <laughs> that was almost a mistake. <clears throat> anyway, you know when Jesus found you, what is your hardware stores here? In, in the United States, we have Home Depot. <laughs> What's your hardware store's names here? I forgot. <laughs> Can one person say to me? <laughs> Muco. Muco. Buco. Buco. Okay. So Jesus found you in Buco. Walking around there with your coveralls and your hard hat and your tool belt. You're looking for a plan and a tool to fix your life. 
And the Holy Spirit found you there and he took your tool belt off and he took your coveralls off and <laughs> stripped you of everything that you had and he led you into the garden center and to introduce you to the tree of life. You understand what I'm saying to you here today? Because some of us always look for a plan to come out of the thing, but the plan is already finished. The plan is already provided for. God just wants you to feed from the tree of life all the time. Because if you feed from the tree of life, reality is you have a relationship with Jesus. All these things work, boils down to one thing, an intimate relationship with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. I don't like weird stuff. Some people do weird things in the kingdom of God. I don't like it. I, I visit many churches in the United States and Canada, and I've seen some weird things. I've, I, I arrived at the church, and they had battle shoes outside in the foyer because at one stage, the pastor can just decide it's time for them all to march, and they all put battle shoes on, military boots, and they begin to jump around and march in the church. Stuff like that, that's weird. Are, are you with me? That's so off. There's something wrong in, the, in these people's minds. Are you with me? I was in a meeting where they preach, and every time they make a good statement, this woman would jump up with a, with a horn and blow the horn. How many of you heard a horn being blown? I don't mind that people blow horns. They can blow it as much as they want, but I don't want to hear a horn in the middle of a sermon every five minutes. Were you there? I don't know, but it was in that same city. <clears throat> but I don't like weird stuff. See, what, what, the, what the finished work of the cross does, it throw all that stuff out. All those things kill. It kills all those things. That's why the intercessors, I love intercessors, but the, the, the theology that people have around intercessor prayer is weird because most of it is a future event. I hug a, a homosexual one day, one day in the church, and afterwards the intercessors jump on me and they dust me off. And they say, you have picked up something. I said, here's the reality. Under the old covenant, when you touch anything that is defiled, you become defiled. Guess what? I'm under the new covenant. I'm righteous. Everything I touch become righteous. Are you with me? Isn't that true? I don't like weird stuff. And the finished work of the cross killed those things. And the church become real. I love it when things are real. Because at the end of the day, it's a matter of you've come to the conclusion and the reality that Christ lives in me and I'm in Christ. And I have the ability to hear God's voice. And if you are in a difficult situation this morning, we can maybe lay hands on you. We can minister to you. That is, that is awesome. But some people are not skillful in the word of righteousness. They need people to minister to them. Some people are so bombarded with circumstances. That's why I believe in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is important. Because sometimes, some of us have a bad week. How many of you agree with me on that? You woke up one morning and that day everything just go wrong. And you need the body of Christ. That's why Paul say in Philemon 6, he said that the sharing of our faith uh, become effective through the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in us in Christ Jesus. So when we begin to share with one another, we begin to acknowledge the good things that's already in us in Christ Jesus that we have received through the resurrection of Jesus, through the ascension of Jesus. What shall we say of all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His only begotten Son, but gave Him up for us all. That, isn't it beautiful? How shall He not freely give us all things? If God has gave up His Son, how shall He not freely give us all things? You have already received everything to live a victorious life here and now. Not tomorrow, now. In this moment. That's why faith is now. That's why God, when God is pleased with faith, you know what He is pleased with? He's not pleased with the reality that you put stuff in the future. He's pleased when you believe it's now. <laughs> he's pleased when you believe that I got it. Then the Father is pleased. He said, man, he's finally, finally Peter got it. 
that boy of mine, he got it now. He's not living in the future anymore. He's living now. Amen? I believe there's future things that's going to happen, but that's not my, that's not my business. <coughs> you agree with me? Now faith is. Now salvation, the day of salvation is. Now Christ is living in me. Now I am in Christ. Now I'm in the kingdom. Why? Because one man decided to go to the cross and he killed that man who was into behavior modification, who tried to live up to a standard, who tried to better himself, that become frustrated and annoyed. I remember in my past pastoral days when I was uh, uh, in a religious pastor, you really know me, I was more frustrated and annoyed than any other thing because of religion. And I was always a kind of a rebel too. You put a rebel in a religious setup, <laughs> you got the disaster. I never obey the rules. I always break them. Oh, and I feel so bad. I don't know how many times the board call me in. Okay, pastor, we got to talk to you about this stuff you've done now again. Or what you've said again. I was always a rebel. And it made me feel so unworthy. Until one day the father said to me, Peter, you know what? I like you just the way you are. I made you that way. I like you. I really like you. I said, thank you, Jesus. Set me free. That, those guys, they can say what they like. This is me. You can't change me. This is how I am. Over the years, I've laid some stuff down. It's the Holy Spirit working in my life. I didn't do it even in my own ability. He did it. One day, he said, hey, I don't do that anymore. Why is that? Or I'm not frustrated about that situation anymore. Why is that? I'm not fearful about this. Isn't it beautiful? When the peace of God flood your heart. I dream one night that uh, um, I was lying in my bed. I'm not even on my sermon anymore. I was lying in my bed and I dreamed this python snake is right around me. And this thing is really getting, now really getting me. And really, and then I woke up and I felt like I'm stuck. This thing is in my bed with me. And I got the light on and then I saw it's the blankets and stuff all around my body as I was rolling around in the bed with my stresses and fears and stuff that I had. But once you got the gospel of grace, peace flood your heart. If you don't have peace in your Christian walk, you are hearing a wrong gospel. If you hear the gospel that tells you that the work is done and you are a finished product and that you've been perfected in Christ Jesus, peace will flood your heart you know what is interesting about that you begin to hear god's voice you are more sensitive to his voice some months ago i got involved in a business deal or some business and things with people and the moment that i got involved in it i felt so lonely i said to kathy i feel so lonely i don't know what it is and after a while through circumstances she stopped me one day she said just turn around and come back home right now <laughs> there were some circumstances and I was just relieved and I realized afterwards I says father what was that he says I was not in that you were in it that's why you felt so lonely everything that, that was such a paradigm shift in our minds you come to that conclusion that everything is done and now I'm walking it out in this earth by hearing the voice of the Father. Jesus says the Son can do nothing unless the Father shows Him. What an awesome place to live. Huh? When Jesus spit in the ground, make mud, put it on a guy's eyes, do you think He just sucked it out of His thumb? Okay, that's a good idea. Let's try that. Maybe it will work. I saw that witch down the street did it one day. No, the Father is showing that. Are you guys with me? He show him stuff like that, weird stuff. That's weird. Huh? Okay, this guy is blind. Spit in the soil, make mud, put it on his eyes. You better hear from God. There's a blind guy that visited us today. Okay, Donnie is going to spit in the mud outside and put it on his eyes. I hope we hear from God. <laughs> But don't you think that's an awesome place to be? Jesus arrived at the, the bath of Siloam 
And he only healed one guy. How many of you agree with me? There was a lot of sick people. He just healed one guy. Other places he show up at the town and he healed the whole town. He was led by the Spirit. The crippled man that Peter healed, I believe Jesus walked by that guy many times. I believe he was asking Jesus, thought, ah, we're going to leave him for Peter. He's going to pass by here one day. But here's, and I'm closing down, here's what Peter said to that crippled guy. Gold and silver I don't have. But what I have, come on people. What I have. Have. Now I'm talking to the body of Christ, the church. He says, what we have. Say what I have. See, you don't have to jump through 10 hurdles to get that. You don't have to pray nights through to get that. You don't have to do any weird thing to get that. That's just a matter of coming to the conclusion and find the revelation of Jesus have finished it and you are risen from the dead with Him and you can stand here and say today, what I have. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. Are you with me? Come on. What I have. The church got it. We got it. I'm preaching the stuff, 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 the stuff wherever I go. <clears throat> I just want to encourage the body of Christ to come to that conclusion. It's done. I got it. It got nothing to do with your makeup. It got nothing to do where you come from. It got nothing to do with how holy you are because even Peter say in that same passage, you think it's because of our holiness and our virtue that we have healed this man? He says, but by faith in the name of Jesus, we did it. Come on. Some of you try to be so hard to be better and accepted and to be, oh, I'm such a worthless person. There is not one worthless person in this place. You all got great value. You all have a treasure inside of you. Isn't it awesome? Whoa, this is the gospel. What we have. We already got it. The body got it. That's why I believe in the giftings in the body of Christ. Because one guy don't have it all. And I, one day I say to the Father, why can't we all have it all? I believe He can do anything through me. Don't understand me wrong. But you know what? He keeps us humble in the body. This Sunday, this guy healed this guy. That Sunday, that guy prophesied. That, as the Spirit wills, He worked through whoever He wants to. So that pride don't come out. There's one guy in the church and he got the healing anointing and he's going to do it. We're waiting for him. No, we all are anointed. So one day a lady prophesied over me. She says, oh, you got the mantle of Elijah. I said, I don't want his mantle. I don't want his anointing. He died. <laughs> are you with me? <laughs> I already got Christ, the anointed one. I have His anointing. You have His anointing. That's the church. My friend down in Durban, I don't know if you guys know him, Stuart Morrison. Stuart is just a normal guy. <laughs> Stuart healed people wherever he go. He just healed them. He's on my Facebook. Become his friend. See what he do. He preaches grace and he just heal people. In the gym everywhere. Yeah, there's always testimonies of someone that's being healed on Facebook. And it's real, true stuff. He's just come to the conclusion. This is real. This is, this is who I am. I can do this. Amen? Because Christ is in me. That's why Peter say, what we have. You feel a little bit more encouraged? Amen? God placed such great value on you, man. People's lives change when they begin to see themselves the way that the Father sees them. The way that Jesus sees you. I close down with this. 1 John 4, 17 says, I think it's 17. You can check it yourself. It says, as He is, so we are in this world. Whoa, is Jesus sick right now? No, He's not. <clears throat> is He depressed? No, He's not. Come on, is he cursed? No, he's not. As he is, so we are. I preach it in Alabama, and, and when I preach it, a lady in the audience got the revelation. She couldn't pick her arm up. The next moment, she said like this, Hallelujah, Jesus. She picked her arm up. She said, I am. As he is, so we are. She got the revelation being healed. Isn't that awesome? It's the word that got the power. Amen. They brought a young girl to the church there in Missouri. 
Her grandmother say she, she hurt her arm in the basketball that morning. Her arm was swollen really bad. Her mother say, I think you need to come with me to church. Her grandmother say, you, I think you need to come to me. Just a guy from Africa. <laughs> as if, as if. <laughs> but anyway, you know how people are. It's all good. And she, they came to the service and, and I preached basically the same stuff as this. And she came out for prayer. I think she, she just thought, ah, let's get it over with to please my grandmother. I just touch her like this, like a balloon pop. <laughs> you ever heard a balloon pop? Puff, shoo, gone. She stand there, shocked. Everybody's shocked. I was shocked. <laughs> I, mean, I was like, whoa. The first thing I want, I, st- I put my finger on this one woman's mouth that wanted to say, I don't believe that. <laughs> yes, we do believe that. It just happened right now. You know that kid's life is completely changed. One miracle. I love that. I love that. Uh, miracles cannot save you. Healings and stuff. I've, I've seen people who got healing from Jesus who walk away from me. It's the gospel that saves you on the end of the day. It's the good news. Are you with me? But all these things work together. Jesus did that. Lots of people follow him and believe him because of that. I love this. Why do I love this? Because we are different creatures, man. Are you with me? We are not just you're not just a guy downtown. <laughs> that way. We're, we're from another kingdom. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in us. Come on. We're not just something. We are really something. Say to the person next to you, you are really something. Are you with me? You can see that it's negative, but it's not. Why? Because God break into the time sphere of the earth at one stage and he became a man and he himself delivered us god was in christ reconciling the world to himself we saw that verse this morning isn't that beautiful he reconciled us to him he made us one with him paul talked to the to the corinthians church how many of you know the corinthian church was a troubled church man they were drunk at home holy communion that is some, something I mean the people are. They had real wine those days. So some guys were, were drinking half of the wine before the Holy Communion start. They finished the battle. <laughs> they were all, you know, all kinds of stuff that's going on in that. Did you know that Paul not once tell them how bad they are? He always, he always said, I heard. That's all that he said. I heard this stuff going on. But he said to them, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord and the blood of Jesus. Come on. Paul never go to their sin. He never go to their weaknesses. He take them to who they are. He reminded them of who they are. Because if they can get that, they will come out of their stuff. Are you with me? And that's what is so real. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So this morning you sit here. Can I tell you what? God qualified you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. You qualify for every promise. Whoa. I sit and meditate yesterday on first, second Peter 1. I'll go and read that again. Oh, I love it. By His divine power, He has given us all things that pertain to, to godliness and virtue. That word virtue is so powerful. You study it. Some of you think virtue is, it can be used in different contexts, but me and Kathy check it up. It's actually powerful. It's resolution. It's one of the meanings of it. How many of you know if you've got the resolution, then you, 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 you can take a microscope and you begin to adjust it to the right resolution and then you have a better picture and you can clearly see. So with virtue, <coughs> we begin to, We begin to get a better resolution or a better understanding or we focus in on Christ in us. (laughs) We begin to see, have a better vision of Him in us. Whoa, I love that. Father, we just thank You for all these beautiful people sitting here today. We thank You, Father, that they are washed, they are sanctified, they are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank You that you have placed upon them a calling and a purpose and a destiny that is way beyond their dreams and their minds. And I thank you that from this day forward, they will begin to walk in the Spirit and understand it. And that they will begin to hear your voice 
and that you guide them into the right direction and place them in a place where they are fulfilled and living life to the fullest. We praise you for that this morning. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen, Amen Jesus.